Good evening, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Uh, it is good to be together. I'm so glad that you came tonight as we rehearse and remember the story of the death of Jesus, the Son of God. Um, if this is your first time here, wow, high five um, on a Friday night. Uh, my name is David. I'm one of the leaders around here. Welcome to Refuge. As we begin our time of worship, would you stand as you're able? And we have a call to worship that's based off of Lamentations 3. Believe it or not, there's a book in the Bible called Lamentations. And uh, so this is a call and response. So there will be portions that I read um, and that say leader, and then where it says all, let's speak this out loud together. So, Dylan, do we have that on? We do. There it is. Okay. From Lamentations 3, let's call one another into worship. I am one who has seen affliction. God has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has made me sit in darkness. I have become the laughing stock of all my people together. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. My soul continually thinks of it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is good to those who wait for him to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. For the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts as well as our hands to God in heaven. Amen. Let's sing together. Come and stand. Come behold his power and glory, yet with confidence drawn in. For the one who holds the heavens and then commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrepentant love. children.
has walked this path before us. He is walking with us still, turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart, rejoice when you cry to Him. He hears your my heart. 
heart begin to stray, Lord of mercy. When I lay me down to sleep, Lord of mercy. When the road ahead gets steep, Lord of mercy. When the falter worthy of our worship, worthy of our presence, worthy of our community today. Would you be seated as we move into the next portion of our service? Some 700 years before Jesus, uh, Isaiah the prophet uh, described for the people of God that there was a servant coming who was going to work the salvation of God's people. And he described it this way. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds 
we are healed. This is a mystery. This is haunting, really. The people of God knew what it was to have a lamb sacrificed to cover their sin, but how could another person somehow atone for my sin in the eyes of God? Tonight, we see that the cross answers that question. But before we come to the cross, we come to this table. Just like when we pick up the story from the Gospel of Mark, it begins at the table where Jesus first initiated this practice of communion. For both his disciples, but for all of us who would come to believe in him, he tells us what the crucifixion means. From Mark 14, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and he blessed it. He broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, Take this is my body. He took a cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And I assure you that I won't drink wine again until that day when I drink it in a new way in God's kingdom. Tonight, this service is a moment for us to just stop what we're doing and look long and hard at the work of Jesus on the cross, to consider the price paid to reconcile us to God and to give us an eternal hope. This is the moment that we stare at the suffering of Jesus before we celebrate the glory of the resurrection on Sunday. So tonight we're gonna start where the disciples started this Friday evening receiving bread and cup around the table. If those of you who are serving would come and get into place to, be, to, do, um, to get us ready to take these elements. I'm gonna invite you to come just row by row and you'll find someone waiting with bread and a cup, gluten-free bread, and feel free to take a piece and dip it in the cup. And as you receive those elements, the person with the bread will say this, uh, the, the body of Christ, broken for you. And the person with a cup will remind you that Jesus said, this blood, the blood of Jesus is shed for you. And if you prefer, we have some prepackaged elements as well. And when you come to that person, they'll tell you that the body and the blood of Jesus are given for you. If tonight receiving the bread and cup, it doesn't feel right to you, please just feel free to stay where you are, stay in your seat. Or if you'd rather, you can come up and pass by the elements and just observe what's happening and return to your seat and pray however you'd like. But in this moment of remembering, would you come forward and remember together?
after singing songs of praise, they all went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all falter in your faithfulness to me. It is written, I will hit the shepherd and the sheep will go off in all directions. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even if everyone else stumbles, I won't. But Jesus said to him, I assure you that on this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter insisted, if I must die alongside you, I won't deny you. And they all said the same thing. Would you pray with me? Father, by your spirit and by your word, we invite your presence. Would you quicken our imagination to see what the scriptures speak? Would you quicken our hearts to put our faith in the crucified one? Jesus and his disciples came to a place called Gethsemane. Jesus said to them, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. He began to feel despair and was anxious. He said to them, I'm very sad. It's as if I'm dying. Stay here and keep alert. Then he went a short distance further and fell to the ground. He prayed that if possible, he might be spared the time of suffering. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not what I want, but what you want. He came and he found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you stay alert for one hour? Stay alert and pray so that you won't give in to temptation? The spirit is eager, but the flesh is weak. Again, he left them and he prayed, repeating the same words. And again, when he came back, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. And they didn't know how to respond to him. He came a third time and said to them, Will you sleep and rest all night? That's enough. The time has come for the human one to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. Look, here comes my betrayer. Suddenly, while Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came with a mob carrying swords and clubs. They'd been sent by the chief priests, the legal experts, and the elders. His betrayer had given them a sign, arrest the man I kiss and take him away under guard. As soon as he got there, Judas said to Jesus, Rabbi, then he kissed him. Then they came and grabbed Jesus and arrested him. One of the bystanders drew a sword and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his ear. Jesus responded, have you come with swords and clubs to arrest me like an outlaw? Day after day, I was with you teaching in the temple, but you didn't arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And all his disciples 
left him and ran away. One young man, a disciple, was wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They grabbed him, but he left the linen cloth behind and ran away, naked.
they led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests, elders, and legal experts gathered. Peter followed him from a distance, right into the high priest's courtyard. He was sitting with the guards, warming himself by the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for testimony against Jesus in order to put him to death, but they couldn't find any. Many brought false testimony against him, but they contradicted each other. Some stood to offer false witness against him, saying, We heard him saying, I will destroy this temple constructed by humans, and with three days I will build another, one not made by humans. But their testimonies didn't even agree on this point. Then the high priest stood up in the middle of the gathering and examined Jesus. Aren't you going to respond to the testimony these people have brought against you? But Jesus was silent and didn't answer. Again, the high priest asked, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the human one sitting on the right side of the Almighty and coming on the heavenly clouds. And the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we need any more witnesses? You heard his insult against God. What do you think? They all condemned him. He deserves to die. Some began to spit on him. Some covered his face and hit him, saying, Prophesy. Then the guards took him and beat him. Meanwhile, Peter was below in the courtyard. And a woman, one of the high priest's servants, approached him and saw Peter warming himself by the fire. She stared at him and said, You were also with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand what you're saying. And he went outside into the outer courtyard and a rooster crowed. The female servant saw him saw him and began a second time to say to those standing around, this man is one of them, but he denied it again. A short time later, those standing around again said to Peter, you must be one of them because you're also a Galilean. And he cursed and he swore, I don't know this man you're talking about. At that very moment, a rooster crowed a second time. Peter remembered what Jesus told him. Before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Then Peter broke down, sobbing. Let's pray together. God, our Father, on this solemn Good Friday night, our voices are in solidarity to the cries of many people around the world. For we know that some find themselves alone tonight in prison cells in the streets, or perhaps even in their own hearts, without a community or family to support or cheer for them. And for this, Lord, tonight we weep. 
Around the world, we remember the countless children still waiting for a new family, waiting to experience perhaps for the first time the warm embrace of a mother or a loving father. And for this, Lord, tonight we weep. Across the globe, our hearts turn to the sick and dying, those confined to their final moments, where every breath is a battle, every moment a challenge, and their hearts right now are breaking for their loved ones they'll soon leave behind. For them, Lord, tonight we weep. For those in war-torn countries, who find themselves running in rubbles of destroyed neighborhoods rather than in playgrounds. For this, Lord, tonight we weep. We remember children robbed of their innocence, forced to beg in the streets, exploited, abused, mutilated to make handsome profit for evil people. Hear their voices, O Lord, crying out. Come fast, come quickly, and for them, Lord, tonight we weep. We wait for your justice to fall heavily on the wicked and, your po and the powerful, and your mercy to wrap tenderly the weak and the innocent. Just because we know that in two days we will be back celebrating and singing, Lord, tonight, help us not to deny the suffering of Christ and the suffering of this world. So we place ourselves with all those who cry out for food and justice, for employment and healing, for hope and love, for faith and for meaning. We hear their pain and the pain of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In solidarity with the world, we weep tonight, O Lord. We weep with your creation. Assurance of your mercy fill this night with knowledge of your love. Hold me fast through the deep and steady current.
At daybreak, the chief priests with the elders, legal experts, and the whole Sanhedrin, they formed a plan. They bound Jesus, led him away, and turned him over to Pilate. Pilate questioned him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, that's what you say. The chief priests were accusing him of many things. Pilate asked him again, aren't you going to answer? What about all these accusations? But Jesus gave no more answers so that Pilate marveled. During the festival, Pilate released one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. A man named Barabbas was locked up with the rebels who had committed murder during an uprising. The crowd just pushed forward and asked Pilate to release someone, as he regularly did. Pilate answered them, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? He knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of jealousy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas to them instead. Pilate replied, then what do you want me to do with the one you call king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate said to them, why? What wrong has he done? They shouted even louder, crucify him. Pilate wanted to satisfy the crowd. So he released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus whipped and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the courtyard of the palace known as the governor's headquarters. 
And they called together the whole company of soldiers. They dressed him up in a purple robe and twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on him. They saluted him. Hey, king of the Jews. Again and again, they struck his head with a stick. They spit on him and knelt before him to honor him. When they finished mocking him, they stripped him of the purple robe and put his own clothes back on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Simon, a man from Cyrene, Alexander and Rufus's father, was coming in from the countryside. They forced him to carry his cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means skull place. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. They crucified him. They divided up his clothes, drawing lots for them to determine who would take what. to the cross I cling, make it come to the fortress, helpless love to the forgress, thou art in the fountain blood, wash me safe.
The hour has come. In Mark's gospel, we have seen Jesus heal, save, bring new life, and we have also seen him rejected, now mocked, laughed at, spat upon, and beaten. As Catholic scholar Mary Healy puts it, he who often laid his hands on the sick for healing now has hands laid on him in violence. Jesus is approaching the cross and there is no turning back. The hour has come. Jesus' journey to the cross is full of heavy moments, last moments with his disciples. They begin the evening by sharing a Passover meal together. Passover commemorated the Israelites' deliverance from Egypt when the angel of death passed over the firstborn in Jewish homes, the homes that had the sacrificed lamb's blood on the door frame. During the Passover meal, typically the eldest male would explain the feast, emphasizing their past deliverance from slavery and their anticipation of the future redemption of the Messiah. Jesus chose this setting of this grand feast for the culmination of his ministry. In Jesus, the Passover is being fulfilled. The future anticipated Messiah is here. The hour has come. The deepest meaning of Passover is revealed. Jesus is the true Paschal Lamb, and he would forever reframe what sacrifice truly meant. Did the disciples realize what was being fulfilled in their midst? Despite Jesus' foretelling of his death and resurrection, the disciples still seem caught off guard, shocked at the events that would unfold that evening. After sharing a Passover meal together, Jesus begins to unfold a difficult reality for the disciples. Not only would Jesus die, but the disciples would all abandon him. He tells them that they will all desert him, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Peter protests this, saying, Even though all become deserters, I will not. And Jesus tells Peter that this very evening he will deny him three times. Peter protests again, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Peter is not alone in his protest. The text goes on to tell us that all of them said the same. All the disciples claim in agreement I will not deny you even if it leads to death. While we typically focus on Peter in this instance, Mark points us to the larger group by using the word all several times in the text you've heard read. Mark tells us that all will drink from his cup all swear their allegiance to Jesus. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, we saw that all of them fled. You could say that traitors and cowards were who sat around the table at the Last Supper. The disciples, Jesus' closest friends, are going to abandon him they say, I will not deny you. Yet, Jesus knows what is to come. 
Jesus will experience abandonment in its fullest sense. The fact that these are the people who Jesus spent his last hours with show us that this table is not one of merit, but of grace. Even though the disciples will abandon him, there is one line in the midst of this scripture that reveals to us the character of God in Jesus. Mark 14, 28 states, But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Jesus promises to meet the disciples again, to go before them as a good shepherd does. The end of the disciples' story was not that they deserted Jesus in the face of adversity, but that Jesus would gather them again. He would meet them again. He would be faithful to them, despite their unfaithfulness. For Jesus shows compassion on sheep who are lost without a shepherd. His table is not one of merit, but of grace. The disciples are faced with their own frailty, and so are we. Jesus warns them in the Garden of Gethsemane, keep awake and pray that you may not give in to temptation, for the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We, too, are not so different than the disciples. We, too, are weak. Perhaps we have also abandoned Jesus because of fear or confusion or questions and events that have happened in which we would never make sense of. Perhaps God is not who we thought him to be. Perhaps death came and we lost all hope of any kind of resurrection. And so we ran. We ran, though perhaps we said to Jesus at one time, I will never deny you. The disciples would watch from a distance as they saw the rabbi crucified. And we can only imagine all that they felt inside after leaving everything to follow this man, their teacher, the Messiah. The inner turmoil, the questions, the shock, the grief. Yet when it looks like God has just died, we must not check out. We must not run away. And yet, even when we do, just as God promised that he would go before the disciples, that he would see them again in Galilee, he still goes forward before me and before you. Even if we abandon him, he will not abandon us. He has committed himself to us all the way to the cross, showing us that we are his beloved creation, that we are his beloved children, and he would do anything to save his children. The cross that held Jesus' broken and bloodied body exposed all of the violence and injustice of the world. And it also revealed that we have an incomprehensible God that showed sacrificial love beyond what we could ever understand. Love that took on gross unfairness of this world, 
love that welcomes us to his table of grace again and again. The final words of the Last Supper point us to the future. Jesus says, Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Until that day, the kingdom of God. Despite the unfaithfulness of the disciples and the impending pain that Jesus would soon endure on the cross, the final words of the Last Supper point to hope. They point to the future, the coming kingdom of God where death will not get the last word. We can dwell on the heaviness of the events of Good Friday because we know that it doesn't end here. It does not end there. Jesus' love for the disciples and for us as he made his way toward the cross is beyond our comprehension. A love so profound that it led him to endure unimaginable suffering for our sake. Every step towards Calvary attested to his unwavering commitment to us. Jesus in his love is approaching the cross and there is no turning back. Indeed, the hour has come. After I complete this reading, we'll have a few moments of silence. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The notice of the formal charge against him was written, the king of the Jews. They crucified two outlaws with him, one on his right and one on his left. People walking by insulted him, shaking their heads and saying, Ha, so you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, were you? Save yourself and come down from that cross. In the same way, the chief priests were making fun of him among themselves, together with the legal experts. He saved others, they said, but he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross, then we'll see and believe. Even those who had been crucified with Jesus insulted him. From noon until three in the afternoon, the whole earth was dark. And at three, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? After hearing him, some standing there said, look, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, and put it on a pole. He offered it to Jesus to drink, saying, Let's see if Elijah will come take him down. But Jesus let out a loud cry and died. The curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing Jesus saw how he died, he said, this man was certainly God's son.
This will be our last reading for the evening. We'd like to ask you to leave in silence, but if you'd like to stay and reflect or pray, feel free to do that for however long you need, and then leave in silence. Thank you. Some women were watching from a distance, including, including Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger one, and Jose and Salome. When Jesus was in Galilee, these women were fo had followed and supported him, along with many other women who had come to Jerusalem with him. Since it was late in the afternoon, on preparation day, just before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea dared to approach Pilate and ask for Jesus' body. Joseph was a prominent council member who also eagerly anticipated the coming of God's kingdom. Pilate wondered if Jesus had, was already dead. He called the centurion and asked him whether Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, Pilate gave the dead body to Joseph. He bought a linen cloth, took Jesus down from the cross, wrapped him in a cloth, and laid him in a tomb that had been carved out of rock. He rolled a stone, a very large stone, against the entrance to the tomb. 